Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's session. How is everyone feeling? Are you all good and excited for today? I'm very excited. Um, so we have a very special guest today. So I'm going to introduce him in a second. Um, just checking you come on, yeah. When he comes on, we'll introduce him in a second. Um, but while we're waiting, just to remind everyone that, um, yeah, thank you for joining the course so far. I hope it's been interesting, and engaging. And uh, we have a special retreat planned for everybody on the 12th. So thank you for those who've signed up. We've had quite a few signed up already. So if you haven't signed up, uh, please let us know you're coming. And then next week, we also have another special guest, Jane Nataidas. Um, it's going to be presenting chapters five and six. So yeah, um, really excited to share with you uh, this session. And hopefully it's going to be very engaging. Um, and yeah, we're going to ask some lovely questions to Sutapa, who's um, should be with us shortly. So maybe on the chat we could just, uh, or maybe you can unmute. Like, how's everyone feeling? Um, everyone excited about the session, or what's how's the journey for the Gita been so far for you all? It's been nice to speak to some of you as well. So some nice personal realizations maybe if somebody wants to share or um come right on the chat how everyone's feeling so uh, Everyone's feeling good. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, nice experience so far. Hare Krishna, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining. So we're gonna, we're gonna introduce Satapa in a second. Um, so I can see he's here. So yeah, without further ado, um, just gonna spotlight for everyone. <laughs> so welcome Satapa. I'm just gonna do a quick introduction. Um, so the reason why we've been learning Gita and the reason why uh, all the material that you've seen and the way it's broken down in acronyms and the course we've been sharing, uh, it's all down to Sutapa. So uh, I hope we share gratitude and love uh, for, to him for sharing this with us and being so kind to um, you know, share this wisdom and the way he's broken down the Gita for us. It's absolutely amazing and made it accessible for us. So yeah, I personally have had a lot of amazing reflections doing his course. And um, yeah, he's, uh, I, I'll, I'll let the session go on. Like, so you'll see how amazing he is. But also as a person, when you meet him at the temple, he's so humble, kind. And yeah, it's, um, it's a, such an honor to have Satapa on the call today. So um, maybe we can just, uh, say hurry ball that's what we say when we welcome someone so we can just um say three hurry balls to Sutapa to welcome him hurry ball hurry ball hurry ball hurry ball so thank you Sutapa welcome 
Uh, so Thank you so much for your introduction, Rajiv. You're very kind. I didn't pay him to say all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have paid him. <laughs> No, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, Rajiv is a great inspiration. Somehow or other, he's like a magnet. He can just like pull everyone together, all the sincere spiritual seekers. And uh, here we are this evening to try and uh, help each other, I guess, um, and discuss a little bit about uh, life, life, the universe and everything. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Um, I've got my bulletproof vest on. Apparently, you're going to be firing questions at me, so uh, I'll try my best. Um, and uh, you can also help me out if I struggle. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So, yeah, we've we've had uh, lots of questions in from the week. So we're going to do it two ways. Some people will unmute and ask, and some people I will ask for them who are not able to. So um, if you have sent in a question, uh, please keep your cameras on or ready and I'll just call you out. And then if you don't, I'll ask for you. So um, the first question. Rajiv, is... just sorry, before you begin, just yeah. I'm kind of traveling at the moment and the internet connection is one of those connections. So if I do drop off, I will come back on. But and if I, if I get a bit jittery, then just let me know. Um, we didn't say a prayer, so shall I, do you want to say the prayer stuff of all? Or? Sure. Om Ajnana Timira Andhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishe Shishanyavadi Paschatya De Shatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Thank you. So we're going to start with the first question and it's from Deepa and um, we're going to go deep straight away. So Hare Krishna, um, how does the Gita help you understand the loss of a loved one? And also, which is the most powerful chapter? How does Krishna help you to understand the loss of a loved one? Yeah, this is so relevant. Um, we live, live in times when things are so unpredictable, especially uh, during this period of COVID. Um, the first thing that the Gita does when we lose a loved one is it gives uh, philosophical insight. Krishna explains in the Gita that there is no such thing as death. Um, Death is not a full stop. Death is just a comma. And it's just a door into another chapter of life. And therefore, the first thing the Gita does is it gives us a broader vision. It helps us to understand that whatever immediate shock there is to understand that no one ever dies, that the spiritual soul carries on. Um, and in that way, the Gita gives philosophy. But the Gita doesn't just give philosophy for the head. The Gita also teaches us how to emotionally deal with it in the heart. Because, you know, sometimes we can hear the philosophy that, yes, someone is uh, living forever, but still in the heart, we feel the loss of someone. Even when Arjun, he heard the whole philosophy of the Gita, but when his son, Abhimanyu, died on the battlefield, he cried. And Krishna was right there with him and consoled him. And Krishna didn't give him philosophy at that time, but Krishna just uh, let him go through his process of grieving. So the Gita not only gives us philosophy, but helps us to understand that it will take time. It will take time for us in our hearts um, to accept that time heals. Um, and the third thing that the Gita teaches us when someone leaves this world 
is it helps us to understand the value of life. That, um, yes, there's a, top, a clock which is ticking up there and our name is on it. And one day our time will also run out. And therefore the way in which we utilize our time, our lives um, is so uh, crucial. There's no time to waste. Um, and so the Gita helps us to prioritize our own life. And in this way, when someone leaves the world, when we have philosophy and a bigger vision, when we have a heart of emotion, which, uh, which will heal in time, and when we have uh, a realization and illumination about the value of life, then losing uh, someone in this world, uh, I won't say it becomes easier, but at least many beautiful things can come from it as well. Is that okay? And there was yeah. a second part to the question. What was the second part? Um, what is the most powerful chapter? What is the most powerful chapter? Wow. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. Every, every chapter has its own power. Every chapter is like a different arrow in the quiver. Um, every chapter adds a different aspect to our understanding of reality. But uh, for me, uh, one of the most powerful chapters of the Gita is chapter number 12. Because in chapter number 12, Krishna talks about the kind of person you have to become to conquer God's heart. So Krishna says in a beautiful verse, Advaishta Sarva Bhutanam Maitra Karuna Eva Cha. Uh, Krishna says you have to become free of envy. You have to become friendly to everyone. You have to become uh, equal in mind. You have to be that person for whom nobody else is put into trouble. And when you start developing all these beautiful qualities, Krishna says, you conquer my heart. And so um, some days we open the Gita and we realize this is the mission, mission statement of life. Most people have a to-do list in their life, but the 12th chapter is like the to-be list. Yeah, we may do many things in life, but what do we have to become? What kind of character do we have to develop? What kind of qualities do we have to um, awaken within our personality to attract Krishna's attention? So I, I really like that chapter. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So Sitafa so will come back and present chapter 12. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Opportunistic. Um, so the next question is for Ranjan. Um, Ranjan, if you're there, if you want to ask the question. Oh, hi. Uh, um, yeah, so I had a question relating to like the cycle of birth, life, death and rebirth. And I was um, wondering, like, how did the soul come into this cycle? Like how and why? OK, so how did we end up here in the first place? How did we get into this mess? How did we get into this cycle? Uh, you know, what, what was that initial mistake that we made? Uh, this is a question, Ranjan, that philosophers have asked for centuries. Um, and Krishna explains it in this way. Krishna says that each of us here on this call we are originally residents of the spiritual world. The spiritual world is known as Vaikuntha, the place where there is no anxiety. So then I hear you ask the question, if we're all originally residents of that place where there is no anxiety, why in the world are we here? Why did we make a decision to leave? Why did we turn away from that beautiful place to be here, where there are so many difficulties. So the first thing Krishna explains is that uh, the spiritual world functions on love. It's a place of love. And in order for love to exist, every soul has to have free will. You can't force someone to love you. So Krishna wants to have relationships of love in the spiritual world. But in order for that love to exist, he endows every soul with free will. So then what's explained in the scriptures is that some souls 
with their free will, develop a curiosity. It's not that they're dissatisfied in the spiritual world. It's not that they've kind of fallen out with Krishna. It's not that they're just kind of thinking like, I'm bored here, there's nothing else to do. Like, is there some other action somewhere else? They just have a curiosity. Like, what would it be like to be separate from Krishna in another place? Because I've never experienced that before. And what do they say in the English language? Curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> so when you have curiosity, then Krishna, he doesn't um, force you to stay in the spiritual world. He says, if you have a curiosity to try to understand what life would be like separate, then I create a situation um, for you to experience that. And that's the world that we're living in at the moment. Um, it's a university, it's a school, it's a place where we go through different experiences and learn lessons and ultimately come to the conclusion that, you know what, um, this is not the place I want to be. Uh, this is not the place I belong. This is not the place where I can find happiness. Um, there's, there's, somewhere, uh, there's somewhere else that I am supposed to call home and that place is the spiritual world. So in the short answer to your question is that we, we came to the world because we, in one sense, misused our free will and we had a curiosity. So here we are. Um, but not to worry, uh, we're here, but the beautiful thing is that Krishna gives a path by which you can go back to the spiritual world very, very quickly. Um, and, and, and we're all on that path. So. Um, hopefully we'll be back there soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ranjan. Thank you for your question. Um, thank you. So we have the next question, which kind of relates to this. Maybe we could just clarify and tie up. Uh, Sonal, are you on the call? Uh, if you want to unmute and just ask. Hiya. Um, yeah, I think it leads on quite nicely from what you've just said. Um, my question is, um, where does the soul's karma originate from? Oh, okay. Yeah, right. So you're asking a connected question, Sonal. So yeah, as soon as we enter the world, uh, in the world, there is a system of karma. You may be aware, Sonal, that there are five topics in the Bhagavad Gita. One topic is the soul. Another topic is the material world that we're living in. Another topic is God. Another topic is time. And another topic is karma. So it said that out of these five topics, the first four topics are eternal. They're eternally going on. Time is eternal. Uh, God is eternal. The soul is eternal. This material world is eternal in the sense that it keeps on recreating. But the one thing that's not eternal is karma. Because karma begins when the soul enters this world. And why does karma exist? Karma exists as an educational tool. Um, I call it cosmic sensitivity training. <laughs> so karma is a way in which the universe educates us into a better way of living. You do a bad thing, you get a bad reaction. Don't do it again. You do a good thing, you get a good reaction to reinforce it. And you do a spiritual thing and it takes you to the spiritual world. So in answer to your question, when does karma begin? When the soul enters this world. Because when the soul enters this world, it needs to be educated and karma is the means by which it's educated. But when someone, when a soul realizes its identity, its relationship with God, uh, it's learned the lessons. So there's no more need for karma. And therefore karma disappears and the soul re-enters the spiritual world. Does that make sense, Sonal? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Manisha. Um, again, so this is related to the soul. Manisha, are you on the call? Um, or So she's asked, what's the best way to reconnect with our soul? Okay, just to clarify the terminology, when we say our soul, um, 
it, the more accurate way to say it is that we are a soul. We don't have a soul. We are the soul and we possess a body. And as a soul, what we're really trying to do is not connect with the soul because we are the soul, but what we're trying to do as a soul is connect to God. And the process by which the soul connects to God is known as yoga. Yoga comes from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means to connect or to link. So that process by which you connect to God is known as yoga. So the Bhagavad Gita is a book of yoga. It's a book of how to connect again with God. Now in the Gita, Krishna gives many, many different ways or paths of yoga by which you can connect with God. Um, and of all the paths that Krishna gives in terms of how to connect with God, Krishna explains that bhakti, bhakti yoga, or the yoga of devotion, the yoga of love, the yoga of the heart is the most uh, powerful um, type of yoga. Therefore, Krishna says in the sixth chapter, yogina mapisarvesham madgate nandaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yomam same yukta tamamataha. Krishna says, yoginam apisarvesham, of all the yogis you can think of, madgate nandaratmana, one who has given their heart to me, in devotion, same yukta tama mataha. That yogi is considered the highest, the best, the most accomplished, and the happiest yogi. Um, so yoga is the process by which we connect to God, and bhakti yoga is the most powerful, efficient, and effective means to connect with God. Um, and so uh, that's what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. Um, I'm kind of answering a little short because I'm, I'm guessing there are a lot of questions. And if you want me to expand upon it, I can expand upon it. Yeah. So we've got another question, which is related to the Paramatma. Um, so we understand there's a soul and then there's a Paramatma. And the question is, so what happens to the Paramatma when you leave the gross body? And in connection with that, is it different for individuals, for example, like say if someone's attached to Lord Ram or Lord Nasimadev, then are their Paramatmas different according to the taste and relationship? Um, that's from Dharmendra. Okay, good question. Oh, Dharmendra, all oh, friends. <laughs> um, Paramatma is the expansion of Krishna that accompanies you in this life. Paramatma is like the CCTV that's kind of right there with you, but not just spying on you, also helping you. Um, so the Paramatma is an expansion of Krishna, is Vishnu Tattva, is Vishnu, basically. Everyone has Vishnu within their hearts. Um, now, what happens is that when we travel from one body to another body in the material world, then the Paramatma stays with us. It continues with us through this journey in the material world. However, it's said that at the point when we gain release from the material world, at that time when we re-enter the spiritual world, then the Paramatma doesn't follow with us. The Paramatma is only with the living entity in this world because the Paramatma is like the constant companion who is guiding us back to the spiritual world. And when we're in the spiritual world, then the Paramatma is no longer with us, at least in that way, in the heart region, alongside the soul, because we're then we're already with Krishna. Um, everyone here will have a relationship with God in a unique way. Uh, we'll have a relationship with God in a unique form. Some people worship Krishna. Uh, as a you know they're related to Krishna as a friend some are related to Krishna as a servant some are related to uh, expansion of Krishna or another incarnation of Krishna perhaps Ram so the Paramatma will help guide us back to wherever we're meant to be but once we're there the Paramatma is uh, no longer with us because we're then situated right there with uh, God himself Thank you so much. Um, wonderfully explained. I hope that answers your question, Dharmendra. 
Um, so the next question we have from Natasha, and uh, she's asked, um, we have aspects of good and bad in us. So how do we gauge if we're on the right track and how, and if we are indeed living as the Gita and Krishna teaches us, how can we recognize uh, where we need to improve? Yeah, there's an old fable of the good dog and the bad dog. We all have a good dog within us and a bad dog. Um, sorry, I think if someone just mutes Pushpa, I think. Pushpa, if you can just mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's almost like you remember in those old cartoons, they used to have like a demon on one side and an angel on another side, and then this kind of confused person in between. So we all seem to have this good side and bad side. And sometimes the good side comes out. Sometimes the bad side comes out. Sometimes you're driving and you can stop for a very elderly lady and, you know, let the lady cross across. And you think, I'm such a, you know, divine person. And then you can drive along and someone can cut you on the road and you can be horning and beeping and effing and blinding and swearing. And you think, oh, my God. I thought I was a nice guy. This is another side of the personality coming out. So Krishna explains in the 16th chapter that we each have a divine and demoniac side. Um, it's interesting. In earlier yugas, divine and demoniac were on different planets. But later on, divine and demoniac were on the same planet, but they were in different families. Later on, Divine and demoniac were on the same planet. They were in the same families, but they were in different individuals. But now in Kali Yuga, divine and demoniac is on the same planet, in the same family, and within the same individual. And therefore, we each have a lower side and a higher side, a good side and a bad side, a divine side and a demoniac side. And how do you judge um, what's happening? Well, just observe your character. One amazing thing that I've managed to do by Krishna's grace, which I thought I'd never do, is for the last 25 years, I've written a diary. And I, I never thought I'd write a diary. I thought that was for like teenage kids who had like, you know, like um, a crush on someone or something, you know. I never thought I'd write a diary, but I started writing a diary 25 years ago to observe myself on a day-to-day -day basis. Who am I? What is my character? How do I relate to people? Um, what is my inner dialogue? Um, and it's amazing. By writing a diary, you can actually begin to assess the internal character within yourself and how you're evolving. And I tell you, uh, you can actually perceive how amazing this process of Krishna consciousness is because it actually changes you. Prabhupada said, this movement turns crows into swans. And therefore, you may look at your character and say, oh, God, I'm so envious of others. I get so angry. I've got so much greed. Um, I'm not tolerant. How will I ever change? Believe me, you can change. You can actually bring out uh, your best self. Um, but it requires practice of spirituality and deep introspection along the way. I hope that helps. Thank you, that was amazing. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. So the next question is from Saurabh. Um, are you there? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Saurabh, we can hear you, yes. So I think you you have kind of already answered my questions. It was it was around those things as well. So we we know that I mean uh, something is not good for us, but we tend to do that thing. I mean we we had this reading for chapter three where we we got to know that lust is the greatest enemy or worst enemy for us. And still, I mean how we can get into that frame of mind or we can have that strength of mind that when we know that something is not good for us or not good for someone else, we are not doing that thing or we are just. Yeah, how to, how to overcome, yeah. 
Oscar Wilde, he said, I can resist everything except temptation. <laughs> So it's so difficult, you know, you know, someone's trying to give up smoking, someone's trying to give up, you know, chocolate, someone's trying to make sure that, you know, they don't get angered by other people, but then we again get angry. Uh, how do we uh, change ourselves? I don't know if Rajiv or whoever was teaching the third chapter shared with you, there's an acronym. Uh, there's an acronym for everything in life. Um, and if you want to overcome temptation, then the acronym is COST. Saurabh is going to cost you. If you want to overcome temptation, C stands for conviction. The thing you have to be convinced that the greater thing you're aiming for is so amazing that you need to give up this immediate thing. You have to be philosophically convinced that there's a much greater gain in the future. O stands for openness. You know, one of the most important things in overcoming temptation is being open with a friend, telling them when you made a mistake, when you did well, getting their advice, getting their encouragement, being open and sharing. Um, because when you share with others, then you draw strength from them. And not only that, when you share with others, Krishna sees your sincerity, that you're being honest, open, and Krishna says, this person's very sincere, let me help. So the second thing is, oh, be open. S stands for safety. If you want to avoid being tempted by things, don't put yourself in environments. Don't bring yourself in contact with people who will trigger that temptation, right? If you're trying to give up drinking, for God's sake, don't hang out at the pub. <laughs> I mean, it sounds obvious, but people do this. They keep exposing themselves to the environments, to situations, to people which are going to uh, agitate them. Therefore, safety means always keep a safe environment. And T stands for taste. You know, the ultimate way to give up temptation is taste something higher. We tell people, don't just test God, taste God. In other words, don't just test God by asking so many philosophical questions. Does God exist? How should I believe in him? How can I? Don't just test God. Taste God. Experience a relationship with Krishna. Experience the prema ras. Prema ras means the uh, taste of love. When you taste something higher, you can give up the lower. Um, and, and that's the ultimate way to give up temptation. Uh, by experiencing something much better. So if you want to overcome temptation, C, be convinced. O, be open. S, be safe. And T, get some taste. And if you do that, uh, it doesn't matter what can be, you know, the, the biggest temptations of life, you can overcome them. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Saru. I'll stop with your smashing these questions left, right, and center. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's amazing. Uh, so the next question is from Anupam, uh, Anupam Tiagi. So she's asked, can you have two spiritual practices in one house? And how do you intensify the journey back to Godhead or liberation in this lifetime? Uh, can I just clarify, when you say, can you have two practices in one house, do you mean different members doing different things? Is that what you mean? She's put e.g. Vaishnav or Shiv, Shiva. Shiva. Okay. okay, okay. So I guess she's saying that there are different people in the family who do different things. Yeah. Uh, who is this? Who's asking this question? Anupam Tiagi. Anupam, okay. Okay, Anupam, thanks for your question. You see, we have to respect everyone. Everyone has something they're pursuing. Some people are atheistic, some people are theistic, but within theism, 
they may worship Shiva, they may worship demigods, they may worship Krishna, uh, they may worship the impersonal. Um, the first thing is Vaishnavas are always respectful. We understand that everyone has free will and it's not for us to impose ourselves on others. So in the house, um, we should respect that, you know, people may worship different things. Is it a barrier to your spiritual advancement? Nothing can be a barrier to your spiritual advancement unless you make it a barrier. When you close your eyes and chant Krishna's names, you're connecting with Krishna directly. Nothing can come in between you. And yes, sometimes environments may be challenging. Sometimes you may feel that there are different opinions in the house or different ideas. And sometimes you may find that um, somewhat uh, incompatible with what you're doing. But for the most part, we should realize that whatever situation Krishna has put us in, that within that situation, there can be no obstacle to advancing spiritually. So if there are more than one type of practice in the household, no problem. Let us respect and let us share the joy of uh, worshiping Krishna and hopefully bring others on that journey. And let us see the good that others have, you know, like, um, uh, you know, friends or family may be doing other types of worship. It doesn't mean we can't learn something amazing from them. We can learn something from everyone. Um, so let's try to make the best of the situation. And, and it doesn't have to be an obstacle. Yeah. And Rajiv, remind me the second part of the question. Um, how do you accelerate your... Um devotion in this lifetime and journey back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada said advancement in Krishna consciousness is dependent on the attitude of the follower. It depends on your attitude. It depends on your urgency. It depends on your intensity. How long does it take to cook a pot of kitri? Well, it depends what, what, what is it was how much heat, how much heat is there? The more heat, the quicker. So the way to accelerate our growth is to take things more seriously, um, to do things with more intensity, to have an internal desperation, to have a focus. Uh, Krishna consciousness is a science. And in a science, if you follow all the different elements, you will get the result. Uh, Krishna has guaranteed that. So the way to accelerate your spiritual growth is um, just be more focused and be more urgent about it and prioritize it. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Urvashi. And uh, I don't know if she's on the call, but she's asked, so if you are not vegetarian, should you refrain from eating meat and eggs whilst attending these Zoom calls? <laughs> my other question, sorry, I am on the call. <laughs> Thank my, you for that question. <laughs> my other question was, it's all around food, really, and um, uh, some of my mum's friends would come, but they wouldn't eat because they're rational and they don't eat at other people's houses. Um, so I'm in our own, don't eat um, onions and garlic and Jane's don't eat food from the ground. And yeah, I don't understand it. So just an explanation if you have one. Oh, okay. Why Jains don't uh, eat food from the ground and onions and garlic? Okay, so let me deal with those three things. Eating of meat, onions and garlic, and then root vegetables. Um, okay, Urvishi, thank you for your question. Um, the first thing is uh, being vegetarian for whatever period you can be vegetarian for is a great thing. If it's while you're on a Zoom call, brilliant. If it's for one day a week, brilliant. If it's for Navratri in the year, brilliant. And if it's for the whole year, that's even better. Um, we encourage people to be vegetarian, um, not because we're judging people, not because we want people to feel guilty, 
but it's the best diet for having a healthy body, having a healthy mind, and creating a healthy world in which there is the least amount of violence as possible. And so from all angles, it makes sense to be vegetarian. Um, and what I would say is, yeah, just if you're not immediately vegetarian, just keep trying and uh, build it up and you'll, you'll see the difference. It will come to the point where you kind of walk past McDonald's and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I used to eat there. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it will just come naturally. So uh, it makes sense, vegetarianism and whatever you can do to go on that journey, uh, please do it and, and, and you'll see the amazing benefits. So we're not here to judge anyone. But at the same time, we have to share with you that um, being vegetarian goes a long way to helping you develop your Krishna consciousness because it prepares the heart, uh, a heart of nonviolence, a heart of compassion, uh, a heart of sensitivity to the um, pain of others. Okay. Uh, why don't we have onions and garlic? Yeah, many people have asked me this question. You know, some, like some Indians say, like, I can give up. I can give up alcohol, I can give up cigarettes, I can give up whatever you want, but give up onions. I mean, come on, there's no life without onions, you know? Um, we don't have onions, we don't have garlic. Um, some people think like, yeah, garlic in many ways is very good for your health as well, it said. Uh, maybe not so good for your breath, but good for your health. Um, so why don't we have onions and garlic? Because later on in the Gita, in chapter number 14, Krishna explains that foods are in different, um, of different qualities. There are foods in tamas, ignorance. There are foods in rajas, or passion. And there are foods in sattva, or goodness. And um, certain foods, although vegetarian, come under the category of tamas and rajas, uh, passionate and ignorant foods. And therefore, although they're vegetarian, they um, are said to impair the clarity of one's consciousness and therefore are best to be avoided. And so onions, garlics, mushrooms, they come under that category. And root vegetables, why do Jains not have root vegetables like potatoes, which are grown in the ground? Because um, they believe that when you um, take vegetables from the ground in that way, the process of uh, uprooting the root vegetables causes many, many living entities um, to be uh, killed. And therefore, they also take that to be a um, somewhat of a uh, uh, what they consider to be some level of violence there. So they avoid uh, root vegetables. So um, no French fries, um, nothing of that nature. Um, of course, in Krishna consciousness, we do have root vegetables, uh, but in Jain culture, they don't. Okay, thank you. About mushrooms. Uh, why not mushrooms? I didn't know about the mushrooms. I didn't know about the mushrooms. Oh, I've, I've, yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've dropped another bombshell there. Yeah, <laughs> mushrooms are said to uh, well, they maybe don't grow in the cleanest places, and again, they're said to have a kind of uh, impairing effect on the consciousness. So yeah. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so um, if anybody's been to the Bhaktivedanta Manor or the Iskon London Temple at Soho, if you've tried the food, it's actually yeah. nice food. Um, so you can't get any better food, at, to be honest. So I don't, I, I don't think you can miss anything like onions or garlic. Um, yeah, so, Hare Krishna is the kitchen religion. I mean, you're not, you're never gonna, you know, like so many things may happen in this movement, but you'll never starve. I can tell you that for sure. Um, you'll have the best food, so you, you're not gonna miss out. So, in talking about food, um, so we've had a question from Instagram on our Food for Life page. Um, how does, how do you connect Food for Life service with Krishna and devotion? 
Yeah, Food for Life service is not just uh, feeding people's bodies, but it's actually nourishing their souls. Because what you're giving people is not just food, but you're giving blessed food. It's food which is cooked with love, is food which is offered to God with love, and it's food which is then served with love. And when people eat food which is saturated by devotion, then it doesn't just uh, nourish the body, but it nourishes the soul. I don't need to tell you when you have your mother's cooking, it's just different because she cooks with love, because she cooks with a sincere heart. And so uh, Food for Life is incredible because we're going out there and we're helping people in such a practical way, but also in such a deep spiritual way as well. And, um, and, and it has an effect on people's, uh, people's state of mind and, and state of their soul and their spiritual uh, being. So yeah, rest assured, doing Food for Life is helping people on all levels. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you didn't pay me to say that, by the way. <laughs> everybody, uh, hopefully see you all next week at Food for Life. <laughs> um, so the next question we have is from Henna. Uh, are you on the call? Yes. Hi. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Yes. Uh, so my question is, what does the transition of the um, person who probably dies at the time of death when you're doing Krishna, but it's not Krishna in the form of God Krishna, if Krishna is in the remembering any, the name of Krishna who's been born to life, or a demon who's been killed by Krishna. So they usually. Um, yeah, Hina, Hina, your audio is um, cutting out. Um, oh, try again. Yeah. That's can you better. hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I think that's better. Yeah. Okay, I'll just hold it. Sorry about that. Um, so my question is, um, usually when a demon or is killed by Krishna, I think they, they go to Vaikuntha, but obviously they don't have any knowledge about Krishna consciousness or they're not a pure devotee. So how do they see their transition? And I think they're also assigned um, certain desires in the spiritual world. But obviously, they're demons. They're not going to have um, desires that would be like applied in this. Way. So, what what transition for them? Okay, I I, th I kind of caught most of it, Hannah. If I don't, then you can let me know. So, the essence of your question, as I understood, was demons who get killed by Krishna, they kind of get a free ticket to the spiritual world. Like, number one, how's that fair? And number two, what are these guys going to do in the spiritual world? Because they got all these kind of, you know, warped uh, mentalities and it doesn't really fit with the scenery of the spiritual world. So is that the essence of it? I get it right. Yeah. That's yeah. OK, that's the essence. Of it. OK, so the first thing to understand, Hannah, is that it's not that every single demon gets the same uh, destination. Uh, some demons go back to the spiritual world. Some demons go to the uh, effulgence called the Brahma Jyoti. Uh, some demons, they may come back for another term in the material world, but in a better situation. One thing's for sure, whoever gets killed by Krishna gets some kind of benefit. But it's not that they all go back to the spiritual world automatically. So that's the first thing to understand. The second thing is, every demon... Uh, I once was driving past the church and there was a sign and it said, every sinner, uh, sorry, every saint had a past and every sinner has a future. And so you may look at a demon and think they're really, really sinful, but actually many of the demons, if you look at their past lives, then they may have done something actually very amazing. And they just may be in one term of demoniac existence to kind of burn something off and then re-enter the spiritual world. So when we see demons, uh, we should understand that many of them may have had a background that we're not aware of. The third thing is, uh, is it fair that Krishna just gives mercy like that? 
Well, Krishna gives mercy to everyone in different ways. We think the demons get mercy because they get killed and then they go back to the spiritual world. But Krishna gave all of us mercy. He gave us the easiest process by which we can chant Hare Krishna and go back to Krishna, back to the spiritual world, just like that. Um, everyone, every living entity gets the mercy of Krishna in a special way. And demons get also the mercy of Krishna in a special way. Ultimately, Krishna says, Samoham, Sarva Bhuteshu, I'm equal to all. So it's not that demons are getting mercy that no one else is getting. Everyone gets mercy. Krishna says, my mercy is like the sunshine. The sunshine shines everywhere. It does not discriminate. This is a good place. This is, the sun shines everywhere. So that's the third point. And the fourth point is what will all of these demons do when they get there? Because, you know, everyone there loves Krishna. But it said that by going through that interaction with Krishna, their consciousness immediately becomes purified. And every soul is inherently pure. Even the soul uh, that manifests in this world as a demon, even that soul is pure. And when it goes through the process of being killed by Krishna, the consciousness is purified. And then ultimately in the spiritual world, it again manifests its spiritual desires like that. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, so Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Stafford, the next question is about the world of duality. And I guess we have in the scriptures a, a, a life of, um, we read about a lot of duality. So there's demigods, there's demons, and in the world we have good and evil, birth, death. So the Hema has asked, how can we live in the middle or the gray area, which brings about peace? If not, what is the answer to world peace? Yeah, Krishna says this, uh, this whole world is uh, signified by duality. There's always good and bad, there's success and failure, ups and downs. Uh, how do we live in that gray area where there's so much duality? Well, that's why the first thing a devotee has to do is you have to live in this world, but you have to try not to be of this world. In other words, you have to find a sacred space. A devotee lives in this world, but a devotee also lives in their bubble, their bubble of spiritual consciousness. And you know how you create your bubble of spiritual consciousness? By getting up early in the morning. Yes, there you go. I dropped another bombshell. You have to wake up early. You have to wake up and utilize the morning hours. Five o'clock, dare I say it, four o'clock. These are the most valuable hours of the day. We can't waste them. And when we get up and we use these hours and we chant Krishna's names, we read the books of wisdom, we pray to Krishna, we meditate on our spiritual identity and where we're trying to go in the ultimate sense of life, then we build up a spiritual bubble. And then when you walk out into the world, the duality of this world, the negativity, the emotional roller coaster that's inevitable, none of that will affect you because you're living in your own spiritual bubble. But if you walk out of the house at eight o'clock with, you know, half a piece of toast in your mouth, you know, rushing for the 815 train that, you know, you're five minutes late for uh, trying to get to work, you know, then you're going to be right there in the middle of all the duality because you're not living in a bubble of spiritual space. So that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing, how do we get world peace? There can't be world peace unless there's inner peace. Inner peace brings world peace. So if you want to bring world peace about, uh, help more and more people to find inner peace help more and more people to find their spiritual identity, help more and more people to connect to God, because the more and more people that have that spiritual connection, the better and better the world is going to become. And you know what? It works the other way as well. The less and less people who have spiritual consciousness, 
the more and more problems you're going to see in the world today. So there can only be world peace when there's inner peace. And Krishna consciousness, spiritual life, yoga, connection is the way by which we can achieve that inner peace. I hope that helps. Sir. These questions are amazing. There's like 100 ways to answer them. So I'm just giving like one perspective, but you get a flavor. You know. Uh, thank you so much, Tapa. Um, so the next two questions are going to challenge your answer to what you've just said. So Rajendra and uh, Adriel have asked sort of similar questions. So I'll just read them both out. Is Krishna the only way to salvation? You mentioned uh, just to process what we can do. So is Krishna the only way? If so, what about the Christians like who say Jesus is the only salvation? Who's right? And Adriel sort of asked, if Prabhupada teaches us that Krishna consciousness isn't sectarian approach to God, it's not a sectarian approach. Uh, he shares his love for God with many other religion, religious practitioners. So where do you think... Um, so if people think of God as the creator or the source, say, for example, as a Christian or another name or another where do, quality, they, go? Where do they go? Yeah. Yes. OK, so let me share this with you. When you approach religion, there could be two extremes. One extreme is to think one religion is right and everyone else is wrong. This is called exclusivism. Another extreme is to say, it doesn't matter what religion you follow, they're all the same. If you take this religion or that religion, all religions lead to the same destination. Uh, this is also an extreme. So Krishna says the path is actually in the middle. That every religion can give you spiritual benefit. Every religion can connect you to God. Every religion can help you progress your journey back to the spiritual world. But that doesn't mean every single religion is the same because each of them can have different levels of detail, different levels of uh, uh, revelation in terms of the ultimate spiritual reality. So different religions are like different sized dictionaries. You can have a pocket dictionary, or you can have the Oxford Cambridge Dictionary. And which one is right? Well, you know what? They're both right. But at the same time, the Oxford Cambridge Dictionary has much more detail. So in Krishna consciousness, what we're saying is that if someone follows another religion with sincerity, is it that they're not going to get to God? Of course they are. Of course they're going to make progress. But what we are saying is that, you know what? In Krishna consciousness, you'll find a level of knowledge, a level of detail in terms of God, which you won't find anywhere else. In Krishna consciousness, we can tell you God's name. We can tell you where God lives, his address. We can tell you who God hangs out with. We can even tell you what God has for lunch. You know what? We can even tell you God's daily schedule. We can even tell you what goes through God's mind. And you know what? The more knowledge you have of God, the more deeper love you can develop for God. That's just natural. Because when you know more about someone, you fall in love with their personality. So is Krishna consciousness the highest? In the, in the most humble way possible. <laughs> yes. Because you won't find that knowledge anywhere else. Does that mean we don't think other religions will take you to God? No. Of course. Uh, am I going to sit here and say that Christians have no love for God? I've met many Christians who I learned so many things from. Are we going to say Muslims don't have love for God? They have love. People have love for God. However, uh, there is a certain intimacy when you learn about Krishna. Because Krishna is God in his most natural, beautiful charming and enchanting personality so now the next question is if someone doesn't have that knowledge of god but they worship god as the father the controller the judge 
then where do they go? It's hard for us to judge. Everyone has an individual relationship. Uh, yes, they may know him as the father, the judge, but in their heart, they may have a deeper um, intimacy with him. If you read uh, many, many Christian monks or Christian ascetics or Christian saints and the way they talk about God, it's not just God as the father, the controller. They have an intimate uh, exchange with God. And therefore, I think when we begin to try to stereotype it and say all Christians, well, they go here. And the Muslims, they go here. And the devotees of Krishna, they go here. No, no. Within every religion, there also will be variety. So who gets to the ultimate spiritual uh, destination? The one who has love. And where can that love manifest? Anywhere. Because love is not bounded. But where you have more knowledge and detail, you have a much greater chance to develop intimate love. And that's why we direct people towards Krishna, towards Krishna consciousness, towards Srila Prabhupada's books. Thank you. Um, I definitely want to go back to Krishna because I think we have the best food. So I think... Um, best food. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have time for a few more questions? Of or... course. By the way, if I've answered something and someone's unhappy with my answer, um, then all complaints can go to Rajiv. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, if you want more, uh, if you want me to explain more, or you want to challenge me or clarify, then that's also fine. So, Satapa, so if you're saying Krishna is God, and this is a question we've had from Instagram, um, so you're saying Krishna is God, how come the West has only found out in the last 50 years? Okay, so if Krishna was God, how come the West has only found out in the last 50 years? You see, that's a limited vision because you know what? I grew up in Wembley. I just had to put that out there just today because I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I grew up, but you know what? Maybe in my last life, I was in Delhi. Maybe in my last life before that, I was in Africa. So, the people of this time who grew up in the West, it's not that they were never exposed to Krishna. Maybe they were in a culture where they were exposed to Krishna in, the, in <laughs> India. So it's not that, oh, now Krishna's only come to the West now. So all of these people who grew up in the West for eternity, they've never got to know about Krishna. No, in their last life, they probably knew about Krishna. All of us on this call, many of us on this call grew up in the West. That means we, we were in the West, but it, we must have had some contact with Krishna previously. So Krishna is not for the East. Krishna is not for the West. In, in our movement, we have Krishna West, we have Krishna East, we have Krishna everything. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. Um, so yeah, re religion has its... Uh, trajectory in this world but krishna is there in everyone's life but the religious history may play out in a certain way but the soul is not limited by that history it, it can have contact anywhere does that make sense yeah definitely 100 percent yeah um so natasha's asked another question um so she's asked, does God or Krishna judge us based on our intentions and purity of thought or merely by our actions and tangible seva that we do? How do we uh, correlate? Does Krishna judge you on your intention or your action? You know what? Krishna wants to give you mercy. So if your action is bad, but your intention is good, Krishna gives you mercy. If your intention is bad, but your action is good, Krishna gives you mercy. Basically, Krishna is just looking for an opportunity to like give you mercy. Like I'll give you an example, okay? Putana. Bad intention. She wanted to kill Krishna. Good action. I mean, she was trying to feed Krishna. That's nice. You want to feed Krishna, but she wants to kill Krishna. Krishna was like... No, no, don't worry. I, I'll forget about her intention. She came to render service to me. I'll give her benefit. So in that situation, Krishna saw the action. 
and he discarded the bad intention and gave her mercy. Let me give you another example. Vidura's wife. Intention, so much love for Krishna. But what was her action? She peeled a banana, threw away the banana, and gave Krishna a banana skin. I mean, have you ever offered Krishna a banana skin on, on your home altar? I mean, that's not very nice. But what did Krishna say? Forget the bad action. The heart was pure. Give her mercy. So does Krishna see your action or intention? Krishna sees whatever is good. And Krishna rewards you uh, way beyond what you give. So if you want to get the most mercy from Krishna, therefore, you know, then know the formula. Have a good intention and do a good action. And then you get double mercy. So Krishna sees both things. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Prima. Uh, I'm going to ask her to ask it. So. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prima. <laughs> My question is, it's a two-part question. So I want to be in a relationship and, and have a child, God, God willing, but how do I resolve my mind to be happy um, whilst I don't have this and if it doesn't happen? And my second part of the question is you've chosen a path that you don't have this, to not have this, sorry. And do you ever desire it? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Very nice question. Um, let me ask the second one first and then uh, do the first one second. Um, you see, Prima, each one of us are individuals. Uh, we're all spiritual beings, but we all have a different personality. We all have a different purpose. We all have a different calling. For some people, their calling is family life and to enter into a family life, to have children and to beautifully serve Krishna in that way and spiritually advance is beautiful. And for some people, their calling is uh, to go solo and to live a life of renunciation and to keep it simple, to be able to chuck a few things in a bag and then just move on to the next place. Um, and that's beautiful. Everything's beautiful. Any journey which takes you to Krishna is beautiful. Um, do we sometimes have desires for other things? Well, I think sometimes married people <laughs> sometimes desire to be single also sometimes. <laughs> in, our, in our monastery, we have one room and we call it a householder therapy bed. So all the men come there, you know, the married men, and we give them like therapy, you know, when they're going through difficulties. <laughs> married people sometimes think, oh my God, I need to get out of this. Uh, those who are single think, you know what, did I make a mistake? Maybe I should get married. Everyone has doubts. But you know what? On balance, when you wake up every day, you realize I'm in the right place. You know, I, this is my calling. Um, so I think with me, it's kind of been like that. I guess I was, um, I've been a monk now for 20 years, half of my life. And I guess there's some way in which I can try and help the world and, and it feels very natural. And um, I didn't like force myself, to, oh my God, I've got to do this. I've got to be a monk. I've got to be, you know, it just came naturally. And, you know, and, and, and that's the path that Krishna chose for me. And so I tried to live that. Um, being a monk doesn't make you any more advanced. You know, like some people think, oh my God, he's in Safwise. He's a, he's a saint. Uh, no, no, I, when the alarm goes off, I also struggle. You know, many desires and bad qualities are also within me. We're all dealing with the same thing. So we just have to find our part, whichever it may be. In your second question that you would like to have that, but if it doesn't happen, how can you remain uh, happy? Uh, that's a difficult one because we have so many desires, we have so many plans, um, and we expect that Krishna will fulfill those desires and, and make those plans work out. 
And you know what, all I can say Prima is that, you know, when you develop your relationship more and more with Krishna, when you talk to Krishna, when you share your heart with him and you see how he acts and makes arrangements in your life, gradually what happens is you develop a relationship with Krishna. This is beautiful. Krishna is not just a concept, he's a person. And you know what, the more you interact with him, the more you can see he's involved in my life. And the more you see Krishna is involved in your life, the more you start developing confidence in Krishna. And when you develop confidence in Krishna, it almost comes to the point where whatever happens in your life, you're just like, you know what? Krishna's arranged it. It must be for the best. But you can't intellectually come to that point you have to actually develop the relationship with Krishna. So what will happen as you advance in Krishna consciousness more and more is you'll realize, um, I thought my uh, journey will go in this way. Krishna is taking my journey in this way. But you know what? Krishna probably has a better plan for me. And, uh, and you learn to go with Krishna's plan. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask Krishna for things. You can't share with Krishna your plan. Krishna also wants to know what your plans are. But sometimes he may change them around. And, uh, and, and over time, you'll develop the confidence that, you know what, Krishna's plan is always the best plan. Um, I don't know. That's how I felt inspired to reply today. On another day, I'd say a different thing. But I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Stafa. Um, so we have a couple of more questions. Is that okay? Are we are we okay for time? I, I mean, for me, it's no problem. But I guess everyone, you know, otherwise, you know, here I am telling everyone to wake up at like four o'clock in the morning, and then I'm holding you in a Zoom call till like ten o'clock at night, <laughs> which may be sounding a little hypocritical. <laughs> But yeah, I'm cool. Whatever, whatever is good for all of you, you just, you can. Um. I think we, we can maybe take a few more questions. Um, I've, we have a few hands up, but we, we just got one more question, I guess, from the um, people who sent them in before. Shruti, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Hare Krishna and Radhe Radhe Supata Das. It's so nice to have yeah, you Hare here. Krishna. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, so my question was, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is your favorite story and why? Oh, wow. Which is my favorite story in the Bhagavatam? Um, again, these are questions which on different days you'd answer in different ways. But uh, I think for me, the way the Bhagavatam begins, I think uh, Parikshit. Parikshit for me is a hero. Because mm. Parikshit, he just finds out he has seven days to live. And he just like in a moment, he just readjusts his mind and he just accepts it. And not just accepts it, he just embraces it. And he embraces it and makes the best thing come out from it. Mm -hmm. Prima was just asking in her last question, like how do we deal with it when Krishna doesn't fulfill our plans? So Pariksha is the ideal example. I mean, you know, he's the king of the world and then he finds out he's got seven days to live. But I love the story of how he just accepts that, how he mm -hmm. goes to the Ganga and how he just absorbs his mind. And he makes this beautiful statement. He says, today, Krishna came to me in a different form. Today, Krishna came to me in the form of the curse in which I'm about Whoa. to die in seven days. And so he saw that that curse was actually Krishna. And for me, that's beautiful, that if you can come to that point in life where whatever comes to you, you're like, you know what? That's Krishna coming to me. Um, and you accept it in that way with such grace. So I think Parikshit's story is beautiful. I think... Um, and, and it really sets the scene for the whole Bhagavatam to come about. And it shows how from the most difficult situation, the most incredible thing can happen. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, lo I love your explanation. And just one little question. So um, Paramatma is in every living being. So obviously it's in all animals as well, isn't it? Yes, the Paramatma is with everyone, with the spirit soul and the spirit, wherever there's a spirit soul in the material world, there is a mm -hmm. parampara accompanying the spirit soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the spirit soul is in the body of uh, a horse or a cow or in a, a mm -hmm. pigeon, then the paramatma mm -hmm. is right there. And mm -hmm. so like Krishna goes everywhere with you. It's like amazing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Rajiv, thank you so much for these classes. They're so beneficial. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Um, two people have their hands up. Did you have a question or is that, is that just the hands yeah, up? Yeah, can I, Prabhu, ask a question? Yep. Hare Thank you, Gaurangi Mataji. Yes, of course. <laughs> then with Pranam, Prabhuji, this has been such a nectarian class. I wouldn't miss it for anything. So, um, Prabhuji, I have slight confusion. Um, my con confusion is about Gnani Yogi. So um, my understanding is that Gnani is higher than Nishkam Karma Yogi. Uh, so he need not do work, prescribed duty, because he is so mature in his knowledge and detachment. Like say, for example, four Kumaras. They were Gnanis until they smell the Tulsi on Vishnu's lotus feet. So uh, my confusion is, Prabhuji, if the Gnani has so much knowledge about the Lord, then is he not as good as Bhakti Yogi? Because uh, he is meditating on the form of the Lord. So what happened that until they smell Tulsi, they are not Bhakti Yogis. So I'm thinking if your knowledge and detachment is so high, you are Bhakti Yogi, right? Yes, it's a very good question. You see, Jnana Yogis, they are focused on Brahman. They are focused on the impersonal. They have a lot of knowledge, but what do they have knowledge of? They have knowledge of the difference between matter and spirit. They have knowledge of uh, you know, the material world and its temporary nature. They have detachment from material desires, but the net result of all of that is they are still focused on the impersonal feature of the Lord. And therefore, when the Kumaras smelt the Tulsi leaves, then they realize, oh my God, this smell is coming from the lotus feet, the lotus feet of a person. Who is that? But Oh, that's Krishna. Then they became enlightened to the personal form of the Lord. So yes, a Jnana Yogi has a high level of knowledge and detachment, but that knowledge and detachment isn't rooted in the personal relationship with God. And therefore, they, they're not considered as high as a bhakta like that. Thank you, Prabhuji. I understood. So does that mean that their knowledge is very high, but still, uh, so they have the knowledge of the Lord, personal form, but they are focused on Brahman. Yes, they are. Of course, there are different types of impersonalists. There are Mayavadis who see the form of Bhagavan as Maya. But then there are Brahmavadis who accept there is God and he has a form which is eternal, but they prefer to worship the Brahman. So it could be any one of those two. Excellent. Prabhuji, sorry, just one small question, one more. I know we are running out of time, but uh, my family asked this question to me a long time ago. I don't have answer. And I said, I'll ask Suttapa Prabhu. So, uh, so they, my husband asked that when the soul, uh, soul leaves the body, so as we have learned from Bhagavad Gita, that uh, Krishna is within our heart as super soul. So what happens when soul leaves the body? The Paramatma leaves uh, or stays with that soul uh, till the next birth? Uh, because if you don't liberate, then you are going to be reborn. So at the time of death, what is happening, the destination of super soul? Does he go with the soul? Yes. Yeah, so if the soul, remember, when the soul goes from one material body to another, then the subtle body is carrying the soul and the super soul together to the next destination. OK, so when you're going from material body to material body, then the only thing you're leaving behind is the gross body. But the subtle body, the Atma and the Paramatma together go to the next gross body. 
But when you go from gross body, material body to spiritual body, then the only thing that goes is the Atma because the material gross body stays behind, the material subtle body stays behind and the Paramatma is no longer there in the spiritual world because it only functions in the material world. Make sense? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. And just lastly, the Sukadev Goswami, before he became Bhakti Yogi, so what was he like for Kumara? Sukadev Goswami thinking of Brahman also? or Sukadev Goswami is a more complicated story. He was Radharani's parrot in the previous life, and he heard Bhagavatam from Lord Shiva, and then he went into the mouth of Yasudev's wife and then he took birth as Sukadev Goswami and he presented a pastime of being an impersonalist but actually he was of course he was Radharani's parrot but he showed because he was showing the pastime of being an impersonalist and then he heard two verses from the Bhagavatam and when he heard those verses he said oh my god I must come back and hear the Bhagavatam and so then Sukha came back and heard the Bhagavatam from Vyasadeva, and then later that Sukadev Goswami recited it to Parikshit. So that's Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhuji. I'll let others ask questions. Hare Krishna, then with Pranam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So four, fourth one there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, there's so many questions that have come in um, to Tapa, and I think we, we can maybe just do one more. Is that okay? Or... For me, no problem. You call the shots. I am happy. Uh, whatever it works for everyone. Um, okay, so I feel that, okay. There's two questions. I, I can't decide between the two, so I'll put them both to you. You can answer both of them or just one of them. So Mahi has asked, um, "What's the best chapter that you could could be useful in balancing work life and spiritual life, and how can we fully offer our work to Krishna through all we do?" And Gaurav has asked, what would you tell your younger self? If you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? <laughs> okay, so in answer to Mahi's question, I mean, the whole Gita is all about balancing work and life. And I mean, that's the whole thing. Krishna is training Arjun systematically to live on, to be on the battlefield, but, you know, to be in, a, be in a totally different mindset. But if you were to crystallize it into one chapter, I think chapter three, um, the acronym we use for chapter number three is TREE, T-R-E-E. -E. And uh, it's beautiful because a tree is almost like the ideal um, icon of how to live in this world in a spirit of selflessness, how to balance everything. Um, so definitely have a look at chapter three. So many amazing teachings Krishna gives about how to balance everything there. Um, but ultimately, the whole Gita is about balancing life and work. And um, yeah, it's a, that's a really um, profound question that would take longer. Uh, what advice would I give to my younger self? I'm still young. <laughs> What advice would I give to my younger self? Um, I would say uh, never be afraid to take a risk. Once I was uh, going on the underground and there was this um, sign and it said, the most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it this way. And I realized that in my life, I limited myself so much because I was attached to doing it in the same way. I wasn't ready to take a risk. I wasn't ready to come out of the comfort zone. I wasn't ready to um, embrace uncertainty. And you know what? If you don't take risk, if you don't come out of the comfort zone, you will never achieve your potential. You will never discover what life could be. If you don't take a risk, you will live with regrets. And therefore, somehow or other, when I was 21, I took that risk. Um, before that in my whole life, I was like risk averse, like anything. But somehow or other, 
Krishna consciousness empowered me when I was 21 to take like the first biggest risk of my life, which was to become a monk, to kind of leave home. Um, and so many beautiful things came from that risk. It wasn't easy, but that risk opened up a whole new world of opportunity. And now I feel like if I had taken more risks, how much more I would have discovered. So if you want to live in the comfort zone, if you always do what's easy, if you always want to embrace the path of least resistance, then you will not discover the beauty of what life can be. And so I think uh, take a risk. Don't be afraid. And um, when I was joining the temple, one devotee he said to me, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I'm like, is this the advice you're giving me? I'm, I'm coming into a monastery to become a monk. We're, we're like, what's the meaning of this cryptic advice? He says, take a risk. And if it doesn't work out, don't worry. But it's better to take a risk and not have it work out than never to take a risk at all, to avoid taking risks. So spiritual life is risky business. Embrace it and uh, go on the adventure of what Krishna consciousness can be. And uh, Krishna magic will unfold. Hare Krishna. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. And I love the last words, Krishna magic will unfold. And um, today has been magical. And we're so grateful for your association. And that's nectar from the session was absolutely amazing. Um, so thank you so much. And so much positive comments as well from everyone. Thank you all for joining. Um, Sutab, I hope you come back uh, in, in next month. I think, uh, Rajiv, we have to thank you. You are uh, um, a beacon of inspiration, your service and your... Uh, desire to share knowledge with others um, shows because so many people come and you do these sessions and uh, I think we all have a great uh, appreciation for you and our gratitude to you for everything you do um, and, and yeah thank you to everyone on this call uh, you're amazing souls I feel enlivened uplifted to just be with you and uh, yeah, I hope we can all meet. And if you're ever at the manor, then yeah, come over and say Hare Krishna and love to meet you in person. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, Rajiv. You can close yeah. it up. Thank you. No, and I, and I think we'll take you up on the word. So we'll organize a, a retreat to the manor uh, maybe next month. And hopefully if you're there, we can see you and get your association. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stapa. Maybe we could all say hurry ball three hurry balls for Sitapa as we leave and you can unmute yourself and say thank you as well um and thank you all for joining Hare Krishna. 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 Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Govinda Gopi Mataji. Beautiful session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Hema. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Rajiv Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. 
Hare Krishna, uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. I missed the beginning. Will you be putting the recording on? Yes, on we will. Head? Are you on the WhatsApp group? Uh, I I found this out from the, because there was a message on Sankirtan group. Okay, if you send me your number, yeah, um, I will um, put you on the group and we can add, share the recording. If not, okay. I'll sh I'll share it to the, all the WhatsApp groups. I'll share the um, recording to the WhatsApp groups. Yeah, okay, I got it on Sankirtan group. Okay. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. It was very nice. Whatever I heard was very nice session. Thank you. Very good.